Good afternoon. I call this meeting of the Audit Committee on Monday, April 22nd, 2019 to order. Welcome to those in the audience and those watching at home or online. First up is item 2A, approval of the minutes. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I so move. Second. Kylie. Moved by sale, seconded by Kylie. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Third item on the agenda is reports and updates. First is going to be item 3A, the external audit results, City of Sioux Falls 2018 financial statements by Keith Severson and Brian Stavanger, both from the firm of Ide Bailey. Uh, this is the report on a required annual external audit of the, of the city. I would note that Keith is here in person and we have Brian on the phone. Well, welcome, Keith. Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Again, Keith Severson with Ide Bailey. Uh, it's our privilege to present today the findings and audit results of this past year's audit. Included this in the presentation uh, will be a very variety of items that we'll go through and just walk you through the report. Online, I've got uh, my audit partner, uh, Brian Stavanger, is our engagement partner, along with Courtney Richmond out of our Fargo office. And it's staffed, uh, the audit is staffed with all of our partners and others from Sioux Falls and Fargo for our services that we render. And going through the audit recap, I'll just defer to uh, Brian to kind of walk you through the various steps uh, that we took and uh, go through the, the results. Brian? Brian, are you still there? Seems like the call was dropped. Little technical difficulties. We'll see what we can do. This is Brian. Tom? Brian? Hello? Brian, you got us now? Hello? Brian, can you hear us? Yes, yeah, there you are. All right, so you're up now. <laughs> Brian, I've got that on slide three, just walking through and getting ready for you to present the audit recap. Okay, audit recap. Thank you. Uh, is it on the slide that actually has some words? Yes. We passed that. Okay, so audit recap. So when we perform an audit, we're really, uh, as an auditor, um, all alone, any industry whatsoever, we are always uh, needing to do that audit within generally accepted auditing standards. Whenever there uh, is a government involved, there's another layer of standards we have to follow, the government auditing standards, which really is more of an emphasis on looking at internal controls and compliance. And then the third uh, level of audit uh, standards we are required to follow are driven by the city's federal award program. So all of the federal dollars that throw, flow through the city um, require us to follow Title II of the U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. When we're doing any of these audits, it's just always important, uh, an important reminder for everyone that it's, it's designed to obtain reasonable but not absolute assurance. And the reason really being that we're not looking at 100% of the transactions an audit is meant to uh, do some risk assessment, look at the more riskier areas, uh, look at significant estimates, uh, and do some sampling when testing all of that. So we provide reasonable but not absolute assurance about whether the financial statements are materially accurate. The next slide provides a recap of the timeline of this year's audit. We really begin the audit strategic planning in November, and that continues through the month of December. Uh, met with the audit committee back on December 3rd of 2018 to talk about our audit plan. Just a couple weeks after that, we actually had uh, some of our team on site to start doing some interim testing uh, to look at some internal controls, uh, talk with management, and start working on the testing. And that really continued, while not all on site, really continued through January. We came back out as a full team uh, two weeks, one week at the end of January, one week at the end of February. Uh, we came on site to complete the work, and then in March, 
worked through all of the finalization processes and issued our final audit opinion on March 29th of 2019. And then uh, today, being able to present the results of that audit, or those audits, uh, to the audit committee. So the next slide is looking at just the financial statements. Uh, we're going to get into some of the other layers of the audit that we do. Looking at just the financial statements, which is really the, the numbers and the operations of the city. And when, when uh, issuing our opinion, we had a clean, unmodified opinion. An unmodified opinion is the best opinion, opinion that you can receive, the one you really strive for, meaning we had no modifications or we had no reasons to modify our opinion. We, be, we believe it is a clean, unmodified opinion. Throughout our audit, uh, we determined we had no internal control findings and no compliance findings to issue. So there are no formal findings reported within the financial statement audit. As we complete the financial statement audit, uh, significant estimates really do come into play. There are certain areas of the financial statements, certain transactions that are estimates and that we've identified to be significant. And as we work through those significant estimates, we really are looking at and working with management to understand their rationale to arrive at those estimates. And then we test that, and ultimately, uh, we agreed with those significant estimates, which are included within the financial statements. The next slide is really the other main audit that we complete, which is the federal audit, or the audit over the federal funding that is received by the city and spent by the city. For that audit, we also had and issued a, a unmodified opinion. So again, no reasons to modify that opinion, a clean, unmodified opinion on the federal audit. When we're doing the federal audit, we're really focusing in on, on two different areas to test. We are testing internal controls, which is that second bullet on that slide, and we are, we are testing compliance. So as you are handling this federal money, are your internal controls adequate to segregate all the duties and really minimize the risk of a few different things, misappropriation, fraud, or errors? We had no material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies, no findings on the internal control audit or the internal control portion of the federal audit. Really, the second uh, emphasis, area of emphasis, is compliance. So as you are receiving those funds from the federal government, are you spending them the way that you are supposed to? So following the rules, the guidelines as issued by the federal government also had no material weakness and no significant deficiency findings on the compliance portion of the federal audit. I'll pause there just briefly to see if anyone has any questions. Any questions from the group? I've got one. Dean. Say, Brian, uh, are you going to, um, maybe you're going to get there, but I'm curious as to how many uh, federal programs uh, you looked at and which ones they were. Yeah, this year we tested three major programs. And, and maybe to step back a little bit, management provides us a list of all the federal programs and the dollars expended within those programs. And then there are federal guidelines that guide us as auditors as to what programs we are required to test. There's a little bit of judgment on our part, but mostly it's guided by the larger, more significant programs uh, are the ones that the federal government wants us to test and focus on, as well as considering any findings from the past that would indicate maybe a higher risk for the program. So based on on that major program determination, we had three programs that we tested. We tested the community development block grants, federal transit, and federal highway. And any other questions? I, I do have uh, one question, Brian. Can you, can you talk about, from your standpoint, how you analyze or, or test our, our internal controls? Yeah, so internal controls 
our, we start the analysis by obtaining an understanding through inquiry of management of what the internal controls are. Uh, we really start with last year's or the previous year's audits. We would have started with 2017. We've got documentation on internal controls over the key transaction areas. So if you think about where transactions take place, most of the transactions are going to be run through uh, the payables or the receivables. So as dollars are spent, our checks are cut, and as dollars come in. And so we start with the previous year's understanding uh, and then through interviews with management and others, uh, other staff within the city, we update that annually to make sure we have an understanding of the internal controls. And then we are required by audit standards to actually test those internal controls. Now, we don't test on a sample basis because the requirement is really only to test one or a handful of transactions in each one of those classes. So we gain an understanding through inquiry and interviews, and then we select a few of those to test to arrive at our uh, conclusion of, of internal control deficiencies or adequacies. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, we have one from Councillor Kiley. Yes, thank you. Um, you had mentioned that we have an unmodified opinion, which uh, is the best, and that's what we would want and hope for. Could you, to help put this in perspective for a non-auditor, non-accountant, can you kind of give me examples of what other opinions one could receive based on your results? So really there's, there's, there's two kinds. There's unmodified and there's modified. When you get to the modified opinion, then there's really a subset of about three different types of opinions. Uh, but really what drives those modified opinions, just to kind of keep it simple, is if there is one area of the financial statements that we believe is in error uh, and is, for whatever reason, not able to get corrected, either there's not adequate audit evidence to support it or management has just decided we don't want to change it, that could lead to a modified opinion. Another opportunity for a modified opinion would be there are standards issued by this uh, national regulatory board specific for governments, and there's probably three to four new standards every year that are issued. Not all of them are applicable to each individual government. Not all of them are applicable to the city of Sioux Falls, but if for some reason uh, management decided, you know what, we are not going to implement one of these standards that, that is applicable. And if we believe that to be a material misstatement, a, a significant amount that is excluded from the financial statements, that would also lead to a modified opinion. So the different levels of modifications, really, uh, it would be, hey, there's one area here that is an issue uh, and that could go down to there's multiple areas or there's enough here where we can't even give you any sort of opinion. So to str you strive for that unmodified. If there are any areas that would be modified, we would just uh, bring those to your attention and be very specific as to what areas potentially would be modified. Usually it's lack of audit evidence or documentation or not implementing a new standard. Okay, very good. Thank you. That helps. I, I do have one more question based on your explanation. You, you made reference to, and I see on the slide, the word material. What, what would be the definition of material? Is, that, is, that an, is there a magic number? And what does significant mean for those of us who aren't accountants in, in, in the world of the city of Sioux Falls? Yeah, so when we're, when we're assessing internal controls, when we are assessing compliance, we are really assessing uh, against, especially, let's just focus on the internal controls. There's really three different layers. The, the bottom layer or the, the bottom, um, the, the least of the three would be just a simple control deficiency, meaning we've identified within, within some process a deficiency in a control. But we don't believe it is significant enough to rise to the level of the second area, the significant deficiency. And it's mostly driven by what do we believe 
the significance of that is that could lead to a material misstatement of the financial statements. So basically, is it a minor deficiency or is it significant enough where there could be some errors because of this deficiency? And then the next level would be the material weakness, which if you were rating it, the material weakness would be the worst, meaning there is a a weakness within the internal controls that could lead to, uh, in audit terms, be a material misstatement. And that is a, instead of a significant, it would be a really significant misstatement of your financial statements, meaning someone reading through your financial statements could be misled based on something that potentially could be missing. So identifying those those weaknesses or those control deficiencies uh, is important to really tie up those those holes that may exist so that it minimizes the risk of anything getting through uh, that shouldn't be. Okay, thank you very much. We have one more you know, from Councillor Kiley. An, another follow-up, and, and again, just to try to illustrate um, the level of the unmodified opinion that we have received here, may I assume that there can be varying levels of even a modified opinion or varying degrees? Uh, you know, it's modified, but maybe it wasn't that significant, you know, some of the areas that you may be identified deficiencies, or there's yet another level where I've, I've found several deficiencies, or yet another level where I have found many, many deficiencies and basically your system's a failure. Is that a correct assumption, or do you not break yeah. it down in, gr in grades like a classroom teacher would do? Yeah, I would say there absolutely are uh, varying degrees of of opinions, varying degrees of findings, um, you you could uh, to simplify it, break it break it into a grading scale, um, like a, like in a, a classroom setting, uh, where an A would be essentially what you received, unmodified opinion, no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies. You could get all the way down to an F, which would be a modified opinion because there were several areas of the financial statements that, that were not accurate, plus you have material weakness and internal controls in multiple places. So that would really be the range and then any combination in between. Okay, very good. So we're operating at that A level currently and we'll continue to strive to do so. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like we can continue on. All right, the next slide is uh, continuing the audit recap, this time focusing on the management letter. So your financial statements are in uh, what is referred to as a comprehensive annual financial report, shortened to CAFR. And in that CAFR is all of the numbers, all of the disclosures, within your financial statements, also includes the federal audit, includes all of our opinions. So really everything that we've talked about up to this point is included in that CAFR document. We also issue, I daily issues a separate letter uh, just to management, to really the mayor, the council, the audit committee, and management of the city to, to go through some other required uh, documentation, or I'm sorry, some other required communication. So in that, we have a couple things we wanted to go over in, in uh, this afternoon's presentation. If you were, or if you've been a part of uh, this audit committee in the past, uh, and especially last year, I explained what happens when we have potential adjustments as we go through the audit, but I'll recap, recap that because I know there's been some changes and, and maybe just need a refresher if you're only going through this once a year. But as we go through our audit, and if we, we are finding uh, differences from what management has provided, we really operate with a floor and a ceiling. Any of those differences below the floor, and, and those, when I say floor and ceiling, that's really a, a dollar, a dollar amount. Anything under the floor, uh, we basically can just ignore. We call it immaterial, pass, we can move on. Anything above the ceiling, 
We, we, we need management to adjust it. If it's not adjusted, that's where we can get to potential issues with the opinion, potential findings. Anything in between the floor and the ceiling, we don't have to have management make adjustments, but we also can't just say pass, not material. We have to uh, disclose those in communication through this management letter. So I wanted to highlight those. We had two past adjustments this year, one in the sales and use tax fund, which was revenue recognized in 2017 that really should have been set up as a deferred revenue. And then in the storm drainage fund, there was one month of 2017 revenue that was recorded in 2018. So really a, a revenue recognition issue for both of these. So for these individual funds, each fund or each department has its own floor and ceiling. So depending on that floor and ceiling in these two funds, we had these two past adjustments. So don't impact anything in the audit, but significant enough, we need to bring it to your attention through the management letter. In that management letter, we also have, as we go through our audit process and our audit procedures, and you know, we've talked a lot about findings, and we didn't have any formal findings, but there are certain processes that we see that we think, you know what, this might be a best practices suggestion that we want, we want management to be aware of. So we performed some inventory observations this year at the fleet department and the street department and just had some best practices suggestions for those two departments. In the fleet department to perform a full year-end inventory observation. And what we mean by that is we really were operating uh, off of what was in the perpetual system, what's recorded throughout the year within the accounting system. When we went out to actually count what was there in the fleet department, there were differences. The differences were not significant, but there were differences. So we said, you know what, at the end of the year, what we recommend is that your city staff perform a full year-end observation and then make those adjustments within the accounting system. In the street department, uh, there is some year-end observation that's done, but a lot of that documentation that is done um, is then discarded after the observation is done by city staff, which just makes it more difficult, or it would be an improvement in the process if that documentation was maintained really as audit evidence. So similar to the fleet department, within the street department, we were still able to get comfortable with everything. It was nothing significant, but just some best practices to better manage the inventory and the controls over that inventory in those two departments. So I'll pause again for any questions. Any questions from the committee? Councillor Kiley. What is the recommendation? Uh, how long do you suggest uh, documentation surrounding inventory should be retained? I know that we have a policy uh, with our programming at the South Dakota Safety Council that we actually we hold on to paper records for seven years, but our electronic records are maintained for 10. Do you, is it in this time frame, or what is the recommendation for what you note here within our city operations? You know, I, I think, I don't think that paperwork uh, needs to be retained for seven years. I, I think ideally, or at a minimum, it's retained until the audit is completed. Uh, and that's really for that audit evidence as, as uh, city staff within the finance department are doing their prep work for the audit to have that paperwork available would be helpful. As we're doing our observation at your end, that paperwork would be helpful. And then as we are going through and completing our audit procedures, uh, that paperwork would be helpful. So I would say at a minimum, uh, you know, just to kind of keep it, keep it safe, probably six months. Uh, but once you get past that, I, I don't know if there's huge value in keeping that, but definitely getting through that next year's audit would be beneficial. Okay. Well, that would make our business manager happy. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, and so uh, this is Councillor Neitzert. Uh, my understanding was the, when it came to this, the uh, 
uh, sales and use tax fund. That really comes down to federal grants that, that we receive for, for road projects, and they may, be, they may not come in for several months, and it was just a matter of we were recognizing it as revenue when it was needed to be deferred revenue, essentially. Is that fair yeah, to say? There's, there's the potential for several months. There's the potential for, for more than several months. And, and so, yeah, it's just making sure that that timing is, is done right. Okay, so just to be very clear, obviously uh, it doesn't change. It's just moving a line on the balance sheet. We, we still uh, are anticipating Correct. the same amount of money. It's just how we recognize it. Correct. Correct. Okay. And then as far as the inventory, my understanding was from the, the fleet perspective that had to do with essentially counts of things like uh, our, our car parts, I mean, in very simple terms, oil filters, yeah. things like that. Yep. Supplies. Yep. yep. Supplies. Okay. And then in the, um, I believe in the street department, that would have been the salt and the de-icing solution primarily? Primarily, yes. Okay. That's the big ticket items. Sure. And, and when we're concluded, it, it may be useful. I may ask finance to just address what they're already going to be doing going forward to improve uh, some of the record keeping and things. So, okay. Thank you. Is, if that concludes your presentation, we could take any other questions. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I do not. Just other than, uh, as you know, our report is included in the CAFR. Uh, which is part of the comprehensive annual financial report. And so our report is in that, uh, that finding as well. And it's really still our expectation that the city will continue uh, to receive its certification of achievement, which I believe it has received for the past 38 years. And so we would expect that that would be continued one more year based on these results. So we appreciate the, uh, the opportunity as well as the, the service with the finance department. We appreciate all their assistance as related to our audit steps and having our people on staff and in their office uh, going through the procedures. So it was just greatly appreciated. Okay. Well, thank you. Brian, Mr. did you have anything else? I did not. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Brian. Is, are there any other questions of the committee? Uh, Dean. Just one. The CAFR is going to be made available electronically to the committee members. We haven't seen it yet. I, I can say I do have physical copies that can be handed out at the end, and then I, I would assume the electronic copy will be published. That's correct. Tomorrow. As soon as you accept, my understanding, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe as soon as you accept our audit report, then that uh, full CAFR will be made available. To okay. all of the committee members. Very good. And, and I would note for the committee members, if you need a hard copy, a PDF, just let us know. And I'm, City Finance presumably will be publishing it very shortly on the website. Other questions? I, I guess I would like, thank you, Keith. I guess I would like uh, City Finance to come up, uh, Cody Papke, just maybe to... Uh, talk about what you're looking at implementing specifically as it relates to the um, the inventory counts and, and the tracking going forward based on their recommendations. Sure. Uh, Cody Papke, Finance. Um, we met with both the street and fleet department once these recommendations were, were made by Ide Bailey and have already have some items um, in process for fleet department specifically. Um, we are going to do weekly cycle counts, uh, 30 to 40 items. Uh, the way we've measured it out, that should measure the inventory one and a half times over throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, we will also do a full count and make all adjustments and reconciliations prior to Ide Bailey coming again. Um, this will hopefully ensure that there are no discrepancies or anything like that. For the street department, um, in the short term, we've implemented to maintain all documents, all street documents. Um, but along with that, uh, we're also going to work closely with the street department. The finance department will do monthly sub-ledger to ledger reconciliations to ensure that the inventory looks correct. Along with that, we'll work with them at the beginning of the, or the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, when kind of the salt gets its max peak start there. And we'll work with them and their documentation to track as each, you know, winter, any snow event comes through, make sure that the documentation is there as well as the balances after those snow events balance with our general ledger to make sure that the accounts are accurate and the documentation is also maintained. So um, everybody everybody from both departments, uh, very enthusiastic, very helpful to get these things going and we're hitting the ground running, getting everything implemented right away. So 
Great. Any questions? Okay. I do have one more. Thank you, Cody. I have one more question for Keith, actually. Are, are there ways that internal audit and external audit can work together more closely, that there might be, whether it be more coverage or, or some way? I mean, what is best practice in, in getting some synergies between the two? Brian, are you still online? I am, yes. You want to respond to that, or I'll take it? Yeah, I can. I can uh, start, and then you can add to it. All right. Yeah, I, I think as the external auditors, we always uh, start out with an assumption that uh, there is nothing that's been done, uh, or really an assumption that there is not an internal audit department, and therefore our scope is we'll call it 100 uh, percent. As we go through the planning process, and, and of course we're fully aware with the City of Sioux Falls that there is an internal audit department, uh, we are able to utilize the results of the audits that are done throughout the year to essentially reduce the amount of, amount of testing we do. Uh, we, we tip, it's, it's kind of back and forth as to how much we, we do utilize that to reduce our testing, uh, but it really is more about if there's anything that, that's potentially being doubled up, we could, we could exclude that from our audit. And so I, I think where the opportunities exist would be, um, are, there, are there maybe more, more items that can be done by internal audit um, that maybe an external audit wouldn't complete? Or are there other supplemental procedures that we could do in our external audit based on some of the results of the internal audit? So... I think there are some synergies that could be captured there. Uh, if we started to establish a more regular uh, communication with internal audit, I, I think we could uh, we could utilize what each other is doing to really give you a more uh, robust internal and external audit product. Okay, very good. So I got a follow up question on that. Okay. Councillor Staley, let's go to her next. And just, I'll just put in my two cents on that. Um, I think the public wants um, dual protection when it comes to auditing. So it's making me uncomfortable if you're going to defer to say that our, our internal audit department, which is right now is in flux, um, is that we're going to let them uh, do the audits and that you're going to take take that at face value and then you won't have to worry about that. I, I don't think the public would really want that to be the case. Is that, am I hearing that correct? You know, we would still have a responsibility to ensure that we are would meet our audit standards that we would, would have performed if that internal audit had not been there. Uh, but we are placing some reliance on that well, and, and I will, I'll just tell you, the Here's conversation right now is independent audit scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Just like if we were being audited by the IRS, I mean, a person, uh, the IRS asks you, to, they, have, they have mandates and you, um, you don't say, well, I'm going to have my personal auditor do some stuff and we'll get back to you, IRS. To me, your presence would be like the IRS coming in. And hopefully the, our internal audit would be the same way. So we have two two verifications that everything is as it should be. So I, I, I would be opposed to saying that we're gonna, we're gonna have our internal people taking over your job externally. If I can just add on that, Brian, I think that one of the areas that any auditor applies is he uses, he or she uses judgment. And in evaluating the steps that an internal audit team have taken is part of the judgment that our team and our auditors use in how to extend our procedures to those financial statements. And so whether we rely on that or evaluate that, it's important that any auditor come in and look at the steps that either the finance office is doing as we review internal controls or the steps that an internal auditor is taking to look at those items and make our own judgment on how we extend our procedures uh, on that particular area. So it's just a form of, of a judgment analysis, and it does not reduce the responsibility of the external auditor. 
we're relying and using judgment on all of the facts of the internal control as well as the internal audit procedures that have been formed in the last year. And you don't just look at the prior year, you evaluate that over time. And so you try not to uh, duplicate particular areas, but you also want to create an emphasis in those areas that may have concern. So I just one follow-up. Am I correct in saying that your firm uses only qualified, experienced auditors? I, I, I'll be careful on how you ask that question. We have well, I mean, professionals they, they have degree at Bailey. They would all be qualified uh, CPE, uh, qualified auditors that are on our team, correct? That's on our staff as it relates to an I. Bailey employee is has to be qualified in order to perform work on a government audit, correct? Thank you. Councillor Kiley. And, and on, on this point that we've been discussing, as an external auditor, um, you have to conduct your audit according to uh, governmental auditing standards and to the Title II U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. And that specifies certain areas that you are required to look into and investigate. Absolutely. And that applies to even if our own internal audit team has conducted uh, investigations in the same areas, you're still going to do your job as it is required according to these standards. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? Dean. Well, one, and one key on that discussion, I think, is anytime the external auditors are using the work of the internal auditors, they need to uh, provide supervision and review and, and they direct uh, procedures. And, and sometimes that's done for efficiency uh, purposes, but, but the key there is supervision and review of the internal uh, function. If the, if the external auditors are gonna rely on, on, on anything, Okay. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, we've done this di different ways in different years, but I, I think this year I'm going to just ask for a motion to accept the external audit for 2018, just to formalize it. I so move. <clears throat> Moved by sale. Seconded by Dean. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The audit report is accepted. Thank you very much. Next up is item 3B, South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance, Emerging Trends and Risks in Municipalities. Uh, this item was suggested by uh, Rich Oaksel. It should be a really interesting topic. Uh, presenting today is a familiar face to many of us, former city attorney for the city of Sioux Falls and the current executive director of the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance, Dave Fifley. Dave, it's a pleasure to have you back in our chambers. Take it away. Well, thank you very much. In the words of Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. <laughs> Happy to be here today. Uh, I'm just going to briefly outline, Counselor, uh, what the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance is and kind of what we do and then go into some emerging risks that we are seeing for municipalities across South Dakota. Uh, we were invited to come and speak today and we're happy to be here. Uh, first of all, the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance was started, or the SDPAA was started back in 1987. Briefly, there was a, an insurance crisis where local governments were not able to obtain insurance from private insurers anymore. Either it was cost prohibitive or even being denied to them altogether uh, through some state legislation and the South Dakota Municipal League and the Association of County Commissioners here in South Dakota we formed the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance. It's grown to 428 members. Sioux Falls was the charter member, as a matter of fact, of the SDPAA. You are member number one. Uh, Mitchell is number two, for your information. We've grown to almost 300 cities. We have 55 of the 66 counties, 77 townships, and we have other special districts, such as irrigation districts. So we represent a vast majority of the local governments in South Dakota. What do we provide? Liability and property coverage. Uh, we receive about 700 claims per year. Uh, those can range from slip and falls on public property, auto accidents, water-related claims, civil rights claims, and employment claims. Uh, part of what we do 
uh, for members uh, is we do what's called loss control, that is like risk management uh, and safety training. We provide thousands of hours of training for thousands of local government employees across South Dakota. These can be all types of trainings from open trench to uh, forklift to defensive driving is probably the most popular one. Uh, with thousands of local government employees out there, you can imagine there are a few auto accidents across South Dakota. Uh, defensive driving is a common one being done. Each member uh, of the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance gets a loss control survey every three years, and this is done through an independent vendor that we utilize. They are sa safety certified, OSHA certified, et cetera. They do walkthroughs through city buildings and city properties to inspect different areas to alert the member of some possible areas. One example would be uh, the uh, Safety Benefits Incorporated, who is the vendor. They are playground equipment certified, meaning they can go through a city park or a, a local park and identify if there's some playground equipment that needs either servicing or repair, replacement, et cetera, and that's done every three years. We also provide what's called an employment practices hotline. This is a hotline where we staff it with uh, employment law related uh, legal experts, attorneys who handle legal calls. That's about 100 per year we receive from members. This year we also started a government practices hotline which basically encompasses everything else that government may do. And that likewise is staffed by a panel of attorneys in, licensed in South Dakota who can handle those types of questions who are uniquely versed in uh, county or, or city government or local government. Uh, now getting to the topic. Uh, I had given this speech to these, uh, a similar speech about a year ago, and I think that's what prompted the invite to here. What are we seeing? I go to national conferences, I see, I read the literature. What's going on nationally that may be affecting South Dakota here as far as what risks are out there? Uh, civil rights cases against law enforcement, of course, uh, we read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV. Those have certainly been rising nationally. And employment-related claims have been rising substantially across the country. Uh, as I indicated earlier, in response to that national trend, several years ago we started the Employment Practices Hotline. It's grown to about 100 calls per year. Excuse me. Uh, the emerging trends affecting South Dakota uh, I think one is extremely unique to us in terms of resources, and that is the increasing number of interactions between people with mental health issues and law enforcement. Uh, the other one I'll be talking about today is cyber liability. That is probably the number one topic. If you go to any risk conference anywhere in this nation, that's the number one issue. And then if we have time, I'll talk briefly about property damage claims. Uh, even though the city is not uh, part of our property program, I will discuss it briefly because it does affect every local government in South Dakota. Uh, excuse me, clicker goes two at, two at a time, my apologies. Uh, back in 2016, in light of this crisis of resources, the uh, Chief Justice Gilbertson of the South Dakota Supreme Court and Governor Dennis Dugard uh, started a task force and they called it the Mental Health Task Force. They wanted to study how individuals with mental illness encounter law enforcement move through the court system, jails, and probation. The goals uh, were to improve public safety and the treatment of people with mental illness throughout the system, to more I effectively identify uh, folks with mental illness coming into contact with the criminal justice system, have improved training, uh, better use of tools and resources, and better allocate the limited resources available. Uh, for our members, we have most of the county jails are a member, part of our uh, liability coverage program, so we, of course, deal with these types of issues on a daily basis. Uh, and certainly your law enforcement officers here would be affected as well. What was interesting about the task force is that they estimated one in five U.S. adults has a mental illness. That's 20%. That's a staggering figure. And they believe that about 4% of the population has a serious mental illness. South Dakota, they don't know for sure with our data that is not corroborating essentially that, but they do believe we're probably lower than national average, but we have a significant uh, staffing shortage here in South Dakota. Now the estimate for South Dakota is that approximately 7 to 10 percent of all encounters with law enforcement involve people with mental illness. So you have about 230 officers here in the city of Sioux Falls you can anticipate that up to 10% of their encounters are involving folks with mental health issues. 
Uh, law enforcement serves, this is another finding of the report, the primary response to a mental health crisis in any community. Again, who do, who do people normally call, but law enforcement first. Uh, and certainly, and it went through the report, and I'll give you the site to where you can find and read the whole report yourselves, but Minnehaha County started a crisis intervention team about 2011. A crisis intervention team is comprised of individuals uh, with mental health care providers, uh, local law enforcement, other first responders, and it's kind of a holistic approach uh, in terms of how to address uh, mental health issues in a community. The report noted that there's been a six-fold increase in the utilization of that local, your local area intervention team in the, since 2011. It identified that the crisis intervention trained agencies are located in southeastern South Dakota, the city of Pierre area, and the Rapid City areas, and then noted that, again, yours was started in 2011 here, and then Pierce started one in 2016. And then what affects our members the most is most incarceration facilities in South Dakota lack immediate access to mental health professionals. You are fortunate here in Sioux Falls, you do have an extensive uh, mental health care professional network here, but most of the state simply does not have that type of uh, health, mental health care professional available in their county or even in the next county over. It is a crisis and it is certainly a risk for everyone in South Dakota in terms of how we are gonna deal with it. Uh, you can get the entire report uh, at the link indicated there. And again, just to give you an indication in terms of uh, where this is going, uh, the South Dakota legislature I've heard is having five different studies on the resources available regarding mental health issues. So it is something that certainly all levels of government are taking a look at and how to address. Uh, as far as the crisis intervention training, this is where the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance has come in again. We have paired up with the Sheriff's Association, both in South Dakota and also Minnesota, as well as the South Dakota Division of Criminal Investigation. We have uh, jointly sponsored a new and revised training model on crisis intervention training. This is a combination of a video and on-site course, and the, every law enforcement officer within the state of South Dakota can take this free of charge. We want to make it available universally across the state. If you ask your local law enforcement officers here what one of the biggest issues they are dealing with on a daily basis is exactly this issue. Are we equipped? Do we have the proper training? Are we able to really deal with uh, an encounter with someone who has a unique mental health uh, illness that somehow uh, certainly creates some issues for law enforcement? So that is a crisis of resources. On to the Unless anyone's got a question on that first before I move on to the next topic. All right, and cyber liability uh, is not, is something related to essentially computers and information technology networks. A bit of brief background, about only 13% of public risk managers believe that they have a, a decent enough comfort level that they have enough protection against a cyber threat. Any entity is vulnerable. We've seen that across the country. If you go to any risk management conference, this is probably one of the topic, topics that will always be addressed. Uh, pardon me, okay. Uh, in a recent issue of Cybent News on December 18th of 2018, they noted that local governments are a popular target for a cyber uh, liability threat because of their high level of personal identifying information that are contained in their records. A local vendor, Cybersecurity Ventures, uh, who's interviewed for that article, estimated that 3.8 million records are stolen from data breaches on a daily basis. It works out to 44 every second. Over 75% of the healthcare industry has been affected with malware in 2016. Nationally, by 2020, we will have 200 billion, I didn't say million, I said billion devices connected. And 95% of cybersecurity breaches are due to human error. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, I went to a conference in March 4 of 2019. It's uh, the Association of Governmental Risk Pools, uh, which we are a member of. And as a matter of fact, we have received what's called AGRIP recognition, meaning we are in the top echelon of public entity pools across the United States. 
where we have the proper uh, policies in place, uh, following proper actuarial standards as far as what we are doing as an, uh, as an entity. And the biggest topic at that AGRIP conference was naturally, again, cyber liability. They identified that three top claims by volume for public entities across the nation are phishing with a PH, uh, ransomware, and hacking. And I'll get into each of those in a moment. Uh, phishing, we've probably heard these terms, but essentially it's a common method of online identity theft and virus spreading. Email messages that spoof or mimic uh, either banks or credit card companies or other vendors uh, asking for some type of personal or financial information. Uh, they may ask the recipient of that email uh, to click onto a website to send a fake email uh, back, etc. And again, this is a common problem. Think about the city of Sioux Falls. You have 1,300 employees. Your, your link is only as strong as its weakest, uh, your chain is only as strong as its weakest link. It only takes one employee, one time, to click on something that may be a phishing email that could infect your entire system. It's just staggering to even think about what could happen just from one out of 1,300 individuals. Uh, a common issue in South Dakota that I've seen certainly in my year and a half with the pool has been we have some uh, local government people that are using another email, say a Gmail account or a, a Google email account, and it's starting to get confusing to people because they're not sure if Jay Anderson is, you know, really at the proper city email address or whether it's someone else. And it gets very confusing very quickly. And I found that to be probably the biggest risk for South Dakota is if people are using different email addresses, and certainly all of you folks have the at SiouxFalls.org uh, as far as the elected officials go that really helps in that regard. But some of the things they recommend uh, awareness training for all employees, uh, multi-factored authentication of emails, uh, have maybe external in the subject line, and enable a tool tip to warn that it's from an outside domain, again, like an external uh, email indicator. Uh, briefly, what is ransomware? That is where someone hacks into your system, tries to freeze it, looks for ways to uh, have you pay ransom, etc. Uh, the target can be either a system or individual computers. What was recommended at the AGRIP conference uh, was to test black box and white box penetration on a, on a network. That was terms I learned uh, two months ago myself. Uh, black box is essentially that uh, they don't know anything about your system and there's, it's pen testing it's called, I believe. Is that correct, Counselor Neisser? He's in the computer industry, so... <laughs> I, but it's where someone doesn't know anything about your system. They're hired to try and basically hack into your system to test the security of it. White box would be they know everything about your system and are there still tools in place to protect your system. So the best practices recommended at AGRIP were both black box and white box uh, penetration. Uh, and certainly on any ransomware issue, you want to have good backup of your data so that if you are a victim of uh, some sort of ransomware, that you at least have a backup for that. Uh, in 2018, the South Dakota legislature, I believe we were the last state uh, out of the 50 states to require notification if there's been a data breach. Uh, and the statute sites contained on the law, uh, of the law statutes that are contained therein, uh, an information holder is affected, can be anybody, including local governments, who are a possible victim of a breach of, uh, of system security. You're required to disclose that uh, to potential victims within 60 days, unless it may impede a pending law enforcement investigation. And then uh, any information holder also has to notify the Attorney General if more than 250 South Dakota residents are affected. Uh, the good news is, uh, you are part of the liability program for the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance at the City of Sioux Falls, and we do provide coverage for these types of issues. Uh, the coverage includes website publishing liability if you publish something erroneously on your website, network security liability, replacement or restoration of electronic data, uh, extortion threats, 
business income and extra expense, uh, public relations expenses, security breach expense, including the cost of notification requirements. And what's interesting here is, is we, uh, as a pool of, ent of local government entities, we essentially have a self-insured retention or a certain amount that we cover ourselves as a, as a group. And then above that threshold amount, we purchase what collectively what's called reinsurance. And our reinsurer for this has a national team of experts, both in IT and legal, that uh, are able to answer these types of questions, help any local entity going through this issue, and also includes expertise on how to comply with the notification requirements. Uh, I am not aware of anyone in South Dakota yet who has had to do the notification requirements. Uh, I'm sure it's just a matter of time. And then, of course, we have crisis management services through that entity as well. So it is a very good piece of coverage to have, and South, uh, the city of Sioux Falls has it. We also have enhanced crime coverage uh, that is providing uh, other coverage to the city of Sioux Falls. Uh, that is part of your liability coverage you receive with the pool. It includes employee dishonesty, not, excuse me, dishonesty coverage, forgery alteration coverages, inside and outside premises coverage, uh, computer fraud and funds transfer. Uh, those are all included as part of your coverages uh, under the liability program uh, with the pool. Is there any questions on that topic before I go on to the last one? All right, very good. I've got a question. Sure. Yeah, go back to that slide. So, employee decide you're covering people. How does that work? So, so you got an employee who's uh, a couple uh, years ago forgery. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, oh. Councilor Saylor. Go ahead. Uh, thought you were done. Um, employee dishonesty coverage that includes. Um, a few years ago, the South Dakota legislature allowed uh, local governments in lieu of bonds for specific officials and elected officials to have in place enhanced crime coverage in lieu of that bonding requirement. And I could, find, I could give you the state statute site after this. I don't have it memorized, but essentially it replaces that. And it provides that in case there is some type of employee, city employee theft, you have coverage for it. So that's what that refers to. You mean to. coverage to replace the money they stole or coverage to, to um, bail them out of jail? Uh, replace the money they stole, yes. <laughs> Dave, you're providing insurance for these risks. Do you also provide um, consulting uh, where you look at uh, the city of Sioux Falls risk for cyber attacks. Do you, do you look at, at the system and provide consultation? Or are you strictly insurance? Well, first, Dean, I would clarify we are a, we're, a, a, we're coverage. We're technically not insurance under South Dakota law. Um, what we do provide is certainly the, uh, in terms of the loss control uh, services that are available, we are we were going to move into the IT realm, but certainly right now we are not doing that on the loss control side, but certainly for the city of Sioux Falls, for your comfort level, you have a very good IT department here. And uh, I know from being here for seven and a half years myself, I can't, ima I can't even think of a conversation I didn't have with someone from IT where we didn't at some point discuss uh, cybersecurity issues and what they were doing to try and stay ahead of the game. So you are well served by a good IT department here. Thanks. And I, I would also add that the IT department does contract multiple vendors to do testing, penetration testing, that sort of thing. This is incredibly specialized and so generally it's going to be better to go after those firms and have them help you do it uh, rather than trying to keep it internal. And I know what, that we do it the other thing I would point out is you had made reference to how many, um, how, how many attacks people are facing. And as you know, you go back 10 or 20 years, you basically just had computers on desktops. Now with what they call IoT now, with the Internet of Things is what they refer to it, you're having more and more devices that are connected to the Internet. You got phones and you got refrigerators. I mean, you know, the things so what they would call in our industry attack vectors, the attack vectors are, are increasing. There's more ways in as we continue, and then we have people out in the field with iPads that are doing work and it's connected to the city network, and so 
it just exposes more and more and more ways for somebody to try to get in. So. Thank you, Councillor. Very good points. Uh, Councillor Kiley, we'll Thank go you. to next. And going back to the cyber uh, liability, oh, to what degree, if any, does the uh, uh, South Dakota Assurance Alliance uh, work with uh, Dakota State University uh, in this area? In fact, your USD graduate Trevor Jones is now heading up that particular division at Dakota State. Uh, or maybe members of the South Dakota Fusion Center too because they're all specializing in that particular area. Is there any affiliation whatsoever? Uh, we don't have anything like that, Councillor Kiley, at the moment. We are working toward a, a through our reinsure, a 24-7 hotline regarding cybersecurity issues with national experts in the IT realm. So we're working toward that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Staley. So I'm going to compare what you're doing to to my uh, to ha someone who has personal insurance. What's the amount that you're insuring the city of Sioux Falls for? Do do, we, do you have like generally for a liability matter? Uh, just I can only generalize at this point, but it's five million dollars per occurrence is your coverage on a liability matter. Uh, on the cyber liability coverage, it's four hundred thousand dollars per occurrence. So then coming back to the slide, go to the one with the employee thing that I was asking about. There, So let's say, I mean, there have been, we had a county instance several years ago where someone uh, was, took off with, a, they were taking like, I'm going to say 180,000 uh, embezzled. If we found out that somebody had embezzled $100,000 within city government, are you, do you make us whole? Is that what, what we're seeing here? You're, you're going to reimburse that money that would, was stolen? Yeah, your employee dishonesty, I believe, covers up to $1 million of re, replenishing the city coffers if someone would embezzle like that. So that's part of the benefit. I mean, if we're going right. to go back to the citizens and say, this is what we're getting for this organization, it, it would be that replacement of funds. Correct. Councillor Kiley. Is there an aggregate or a, a, a total amount that you'll reimburse? You mentioned per instance a million, five million. Per occurrence? No, that's why we that's buy reinsurance, Councillor, so we have <laughs> more than we could ever possibly need. We, we have excellent coverage through our reinsurers as far as aggregate. Where aggregate only comes into play is with our self-insured retention. But in terms of the worst case scenario, that's why we have reinsurance and the limits should be more than sufficient to cover any instance in South Dakota. Good to know. Thank you. Okay. I'll just Continue briefly uh, summarize on the property damage claim. You do not have your property coverage with uh, the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance, but I just want you to be aware of this as another emerging risk in South Dakota. Uh, certainly, uh, what has been happening in South Dakota the last five years is something called convective storm damage. Hail and wind have gotten very harsh, as we all know, in South Dakota the last five years. And our local governments across uh, the state have seen a, a massive amount of hail claims in particular over the last five years. This, in effect, uh, can raise the rates that we are being charged for reinsurance, as Count Councilor Sale knows, <laughs> being in the industry. Uh, this can, you know, greatly increase uh, the premiums that we are paying for property reinsurance. Uh, just on the slide, it notes nationally it's gone up 20% uh, in 2018 alone, and that's probably not going to go down. That rising trend is going to be there for quite a while. So it does affect in terms of what uh, we as a pool can do in terms of the prices that we pay, and that in turn we have to charge our members. So we did have to come out with an increase this last year on property simply because the reinsurance is becoming so much more uh, thanks to Mother Nature. And unfortunately, Mother Nature does not respond well to loss control efforts and we're all stuck with the vicissitudes of the weather and what happens. So that is another risk that will probably be out there for, for quite some time for local governments in South Dakota. If you got any final questions, I'm happy to answer them and I appreciate you allowing us to be here today. And thank you for the work you do. Any other questions? I, I do have a few. How, how much communication is there with our risk management department when it comes to things like, you know, you were talking about 
uh, things like the, the, the mental health issues and things like that to make them aware so they're proactively looking at what you could do for us or that we should be, let's say, getting training for our officers? Uh, your officers would be part of the training module that we, we help sponsor, Counselor Neitzer, in terms of that 40-hour crisis intervention training module that we help sponsor. Uh, every law enforcement officer in, in the state is, is eligible to take that uh, free of charge. Uh, as far as communications with the risk management department here, I first want to note that Sioux Falls and Aberdeen are the only two local entities in the entire state that have full-time risk managers at their disposal. So you are very fortunate. Uh, we uh, do have uh, steady communication with your risk management team, and certainly part of those discussions are what types of trends are we seeing, what types of claims are going on for the city of Sioux Falls, what types of things do we need to look at. That is a certainly a regular communication. And the, the um, as I recall, it, it helped me, you're not technically insurance, you are fill in the blank, what, what is it? We are coverage, we are, okay. it, 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 the, the state statute says in particular that we are not considered insurance under South Dakota law. There's a specific state statute that says that. We provide coverage, it acts like insurance for, for lay people, that's the easiest way to understand it, but it's really a coverage rather than an insurance. So As I recall, for, for all of these coverages, there are deductibles though. Correct. We can select and so I, I, I believe our risk management is maybe reevaluating, and, and we can choose different deductibles based, based on our risk tolerance, and just like our normal car and home insurance, too, that would increase or lower our rates with you. Well stated, yes. Okay. Okay. Councillor Staley. Uh, Councillor Staley and I were just having a paper, pass the note conversation here. Okay, so do you ever cover municipalities for property damage? Well, yes, uh, most, most of our municipality members do have property coverage with us. The city of Sioux Falls does not. And t explain to the viewers and to myself what we do have. It, let's say this, this building burns down or to, the, the new, God forbid, $24 million administration building burns down. That would be under your property coverage that you have with a, a an insurance carrier, a private carrier. I believe you're with the Travelers Insurance Company right now, it's where you have your property insurance. So that would be a claim you'd have to submit to them. So we, but we could get our property insured through you. Uh, you could. We do offer property coverage. Uh, we have certainly been asked to quote the city of Sioux Falls. However, we were not able to do it uh, at, a, at a rate that was comparable to travelers, so we said stay with travelers. If we can't, we're not in this to you know, provide dividends to some shareholders, we're as, as a service counselor, and if we can't do it at the same economical rate, uh, then we say go get your private insurer to do it. So that's what the city of Sioux Falls did with the travelers. And what, last thing, how many municipalities don't participate in, in your group? With, well, with your I, I would service. only be guessing, Counselor. I would, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's not like you have quite a few. You don't, so you don't know like the, are you like three-fourths of the towns in, in South Dakota, that you would think? Be a fair ratio. I would think probably 80%, roughly, I would guess, 90%, somewhere it, And it, is it more towns like over a certain population that would be more inclined? Or do you have some communities of like 300 that are... Give you a few examples. Uh, the city of Rapid City used to be a member of the pool. Now they are not. Uh, they want the private insurance company. It really depends more than anything else on the local insurance agent for that community, which way they want to steer that uh, community. Do they want to come to our, uh, our pool or whether they want to steer them to some private insurer? Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and to follow up, I, I do recall a conversation I had with risk management, and I think it was a case where essentially, like our property and cars, we just got a better rate. We just priced it between you and some private firms, and I, I think it was really no more complicated than that, as I recall. So, any other questions? Okay, very interesting presentation. Thank you for having Thanks me. A lot. Take care. Next up is item 3C, Audit Report 1802, Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum. Mr. Chair, yes. say, I, I'm sorry to say I have to leave. I've got a piano student at 530. Thank so, you. Um, totally understand. Okay. Appreciate it. 
Abby Van Delinati, our internal auditor, is going to present this report, and I believe we have, I believe, Dan Simon from Great Plains Zoo, and it looks like we have uh, staff, Don Kearney, Jackie Nelson, and Kelby Maris from the Parks Department here if there's any questions as well. Okay, Abby, take it away. Thank you, Count. Thank you, Counselor. Good afternoon, Abby Vandal and Adi, Internal Audit, presenting on the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum Audit Report. The City of Sioux Falls, referred to as a city throughout this report, owns the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum, which is referred to as the zoo in the audit report. An agreement exists between the city and the Zoological Society of Sioux Falls, referred to as a society throughout the report. Um, that the society will operate, manage, maintain, plan, and develop the zoo. The purpose of the audit is to determine the society's compliance with the management agreement and whether adequate controls are in place over zoo operations and maintenance. The society hires a president and chief executive officer of the zoo to, super to supervise the overall operations of the zoo. The president and the city director of parks and recreation meet regular regularly and function as a coordinating group between the city and the society. The director of parks and recreation serves as an, as an ex officio non-voting member of the society's board of directors. The zoo is home to 1,000 live animals and the Delbridge Museum includes a collection of 150 mountain animals. As an accredited member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA, the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum strives to fulfill four major objectives, those being education, conservation, recreation, and discovery. The graphs below indicate attendance trends and annual membership trends. The objectives of this audit were to, one, determine if the society is compliant with the following major requirements of the management agreement. First, required financial reports are provided to the city on a timely basis. Second, proper insurance coverage and AZA accreditation are maintained. Third, operating funds are only being used for their stated purpose. And fourth, buildings and equipment are properly maintained. Our second objective was to determine if the city has proper internal controls in place to ensure the society is compliant with the management agreement. Third, determine if city fixed asset items under the control of the society and zoo truly exist and are properly re reported and safeguarded. Four, determine if proper internal controls are in place to protect cash receipts and disbursements of the society and zoo. And five, evaluate the operational and program performance trends of the zoo. The scope of this audit include, included a review of the terms of the agreement effective on January 1st, 2017 and internal controls as they are currently in place. Any detailed testing of transactions included those that occurred during calendar year 2017. To complete this audit, we could perform the following steps. We reviewed the management agreement between the city and the society. We interviewed various society management and staff, observed cash control procedures on site with society staff, reviewed insurance coverage requirements, obtained evidence of the zoo's AZA accreditation, reviewed financial records for evidence of preventative maintenance on buildings and equipment, walkthroughs and observations on the zoo campus, reviewed a sample of, society, of the society's inventory of assets, reviewed a, a sample of expenditures to ensure proper use of funds, reviewed internal controls in place by the city to ensure compliance with the management agreement, reviewed written policies and procedures regarding cash handling and cash controls, and reviewed revenue data, trend and annual passes, number of visitors, and performance trends at the Great Plains Zoo. The results of our testing are as follows, starting in the middle of page four. Regarding Great Plains Zoo contract compliance, we determined that insurance type and coverage amounts were verified and agree with section 11 of the management agreement. The AZA presented at the, to the City Council at the July 11th, 2017 informational meeting that the zoo received their continued accreditation with the AZA from 2017 through 2021. The AZA website lists the Great Plains Zoo as accredited through September of 2021. 
We verified that the zoo did in fact file the major required financial reports with the city. A judgmental sample of expenses was reviewed and it was determined that funds from the operating account, account are being spent on zoo operations, maintenance and development. The maintenance of buildings and equipment is performed and documented. We verified proof of maintenance on the general ledger expense report. We also observed while doing a walkthrough at the zoo that buildings and equipment are in appropriate working condition. Based on the testing and evaluation performed, we conclude that the zoo is in compliance with the major requirements of the management agreement that were tested and evaluated as a part of this objective. Regarding our second objective of city and internal controls over contract compliance, Based on our interviews of city management, we determined that the Parks and Recreation Administrative Manager has begun to maintain an expanded contract monitoring checklist to ensure that the zoo is meeting the terms of the management agreement. This expanded checklist will be updated throughout the course of the year, each year the contract is in place. In addition, quarterly meetings are also held with zoo management. The contract checklist is a working document, meaning changes will be made by the Parks and Recreation Administrative Manager to improve it whenever necessary. Previously, contract compliance was the responsibility of the Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation, who has since retired and is no longer with the city. It is unclear how non-financial contract compliance was being monitored prior to this, the establishment of the electronic checklist in 2018. Finance had maintained a contract checklist beginning in 2014 that included the financial pieces of the contract. Initially, we had noted that it was not stated on the checklist when specific items are to be received and or reviewed for compliance. However, at the time of our final meeting with management at the end of the audit, updates had been made to the checklist to improve it, and the checklist now includes a frequency column, which indicates how often each item should be received and or reviewed. So based on our evaluation, we determined that internal, adequate internal controls are in place to monitor contract compliance. Regarding the city fixed assets, we had judgmentally selected a sample of both capitalized and non-capitalized assets from Munis, which is the city's accounting system, and went to the zoo to verify their existence and condition. We verified their existence based on the asset tag number, asset description, or the serial number obtained from the Munis report. We determined that the city fixed assets in our sample do truly exist and are physically located at the zoo. The assets are properly safeguarded as well. All buildings where assets are located or, or stored are locked when not in use. Security cameras are also located throughout the zoo and museum. And in addition, the zoo also has a contract with a third party security company, which comes through three times per night to check the security of the buildings and premises. In addition, the assets tested in our sample were appropriate working condition. A yearly inventory is taken to ensure proper reporting and management must sign off on the inventory list before returning to the Parks and Recreation Department. Based on the testing performed, we determined the city fixed assets under the control of the Great Plains Zoo and Del Delbridge Museum do exist, are properly safeguarded and reported, and are in appropriate and acceptable condition. On the top of page six regarding cash receipts and disbursements, we determined that the following internal controls exist to protect cash receipts and disbursements. Segregation of duties exists within the invoicing and accounts payable process. Preparing and mailing checks is done by someone other than the check signing authority. Cameras are located on each area that deals with any cash handling. Cashiers have individual passwords assigned, which are required to log in and open point of sale registers. Segregation of duties exists between the receipt of funds and recording the revenue in QuickBooks. Expenses over $100 are approved in advance by an authorized employee. Financial policies and procedures are documented and reviewed annually. Cash in the safe is counted weekly by two individuals. Register drawers are reconciled by a team lead at the end of each shift. Register drawers and cash bags are stored in a safe. So based on our review of documented policies and procedures and observation of cash handling, we determined that policies and procedures are current and properly followed by staff. We determined that policies and procedures are properly documented with the exception of purchasing card policy and procedure documentation. <clears throat> the Great Plains Zoo Director of Finance had indicated in our meeting that the zoo does not currently have document 
documentation for purchasing card policy and procedure. The director stated that is something they are going to work toward implementing. We determined that adequate internal controls are in place to protect cash receipts and disbursements. Policies and procedures are properly followed and documented with the exception of purchasing card policies and procedures which are currently being developed. The audit recommendation on page seven addresses this. Regarding operational and program performance trends, the information received for this objective was only reviewed, it was not audited. We verified this, that this information is consistent with the audited financial statements for 2013 through 2017. According to the information received, attendance has steadily increased over the years and increased to over 300,000 visitors in 2017. Annual membership sold each year has also steadily increased to over 6,000 memberships sold in 2017. Operating revenue has seen steady growth over the past 12 years, while the management fee paid to the zoo by the city of Sioux Falls has remained relatively flat. There was a slight dip in revenue, membership sold in attendance in 2016, which you can see on, on the graph, on the graphs on the first couple pages. This can be explained by higher than average year in 2015. 2015 was impacted by bringing in a traveling dinosaur exhibit, which gave the zoo a bump in winter attendance and membership per the Great Plains Zoo Finance Director. Based on the information that was received and reviewed, we conclude that the Great Plains Zoo is trending positively in revenue, annual passes, and number of visitors. The Great Plains Zoo has been adding new exhibits and attractions in accordance with a strategic master plan of improvements that contribute to its growth. On page seven, you'll find we have one recommendation. We made the following recommendation that addresses the result of on page six regarding policy and procedure documentation. We recommend that the Great Plains Zoo Management add a policy and procedure to their financial procedure manual that addresses their purchasing card program. Purchasing cards should have specific policies and procedures documented to provide direction and guidance to all employees who use a company purchasing card. Management concurred with this recommendation and responded as follows. Zoological Society of Sioux Falls created a credit card agreement and guide to be added to the financial procedure manual effective February 21st, 2019. Each employee given access to a zoo credit card received instruction on the procedures which included proper use, required documentation, and fiscal responsibility. Those employees also signed a document agreeing to, to follow the credit card procedures. New credit card holders will go through the same process. Dan Simon was the management representative who responded and this um, response or this recommendation, this procedure was actually already implemented on February 21st, 2019, so it is in place. To conclude, based on our review, we believe that the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum is in compliance with the management agreement and that the city has established controls to monitor the compliance of the management agreement. The recommendation listed above, which is based on industry best practices, will provide additional control designed to provide guidance to employees on the proper use of company purchasing cards. We would like to thank the Parks and Recreation Department as well as the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum management staff for their cooperation and all their assistance provided during this audit. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions I can. All right, thank you, Abby. Any questions? Dean. Abby, you indicate that you uh, reviewed the external audit report. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, did you look at the management letter? Was there a management letter and did it indicate any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in their there system from their There was a management letter and there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies listed. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? For, for those of us who are not auditors, what is I wrote down the word, I think it was judgmental sample. What, what's judgmental mean? Well, that means that we don't sample everything. It's a judgmental sample based on the statistics, the, the range of error, and so forth. We have a formula that we calculate to determine um, out of the entire population how many <clears throat> individual records we would go through and, and test. Okay. 
Okay, very good. Well, I, I want to say that the zoo has been something that's really been something to be proud of in this community. It's been amazing to see what it's done in recent years. It's just gotten better and better, and to see a clean audit is, is really great. They've already implemented the one recommendation that we had, so that gives us good assurance. Um, I, I remember when I was there for the, the sneak peek at the brown bear opening, they, they, I, I don't know if this has been, I don't know if they've made an announcement, but they gave us a little sneak peek of the next thing that's coming. And I don't know if there's been, a, you don't have to answer, but they gave us a little, little spoiler. And so hopefully that's coming because it will be exciting. So they keep adding more and more things. So, and, and thanks for the oversight of the, uh, of the parks department as well. I, I, I do have one other question. Remind me, uh, the, they, do they hold their own account? I don't think it's, it's not an operating account that's, that's in trust for the city. It's, it's under, is it? their account and we just happen to give them funding? I believe so. Yeah, it's, yeah, okay, yeah. All right, very good. Dean. One last question, probably goes uh, without saying, but I, I presume the audit report was unmodified? Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to need a motion to accept the report and submit it to the mayor and the city council. So moved. Moved by Dean. Second. Seconded by Sale. All those opposed? Or uh, in favor? Let's try in favor. Okay. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 3D. Performance metrics for internal audit staff. And I, I asked Rich if he would provide us with uh, the benefit of his knowledge and research to give us some insight into possible performance metrics that we could use to measure uh, internal, internal audit. It's been very difficult for those of us on the city council. We're, we're not auditors. And how, how, do we, how do we know that we're getting the best value you know, from internal audit? Because it's, it's not as easy as just looking at some numbers necessarily, and it's, it, it's a struggle. So I thought it'd be good if you would talk about, about that, and I asked Rich if he would, would uh, do a presentation for us, and it could spark some discussion for the future. So Rich, take it away. Okay. Um, so this is not a report, simply a PowerPoint, just for uh, your information and uh, maybe future discussions, and uh, so I'll, I'll give you some information based on my research and my, my background in internal auditing. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So why measure the performance of your internal audit division? Next. Well, at least two reasons, if, if you could probably come up with more, but certainly demonstrate value. Internal audits cost money. Um, what are you getting for your investment uh, in salaries, benefits, and, and, uh, and that sort of thing? Um, and the Red Book, the professional standards, uh, require it. Let's go to the next slide. And so let's see what the, the Red Book standard says in the attribute standard uh, 1110, organizational independence. Um, organizational independence for internal audit is effectively achieved when the chief audit executive, and that term is what's used uh, in industry, typically IIA is, is working with uh, corporate auditors and, and the the highest ranking auditor is called the, the chief audit executive, and uh, they report functionally to the board. You're thinking a board of directors. Uh, for the city, that would be uh, audit committee or city council. Um, examples of functional reporting to the board involve the board receiving communication from the chief audit exec executive on the internal audit activities performance relative to its plan and other matters. So attribute standard is, is, uh, suggests certainly that uh, there'd be some sort of performance measures and the chief audit executive would report to the board uh, the performance of the, of, the, uh, of the function. So these categories come from a research study and uh, they're, they're just categories, um, um, environment, output, quality, efficiency, impact, and we'll, we'll kind of unpack this in the next few slides here. So the environment category might be number of management requests uh, for internal audits. It might be management satisfaction survey results where the internal audit, uh, you know, the chief audit executive would survey 
management, you know, are you satisfied with the product that we're providing? You understand in, in the corporate world, uh, the, 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 the client is often management. Uh, certainly the board is, is part of that, but uh, so that's why they would sur survey management. Okay, next category would be outputs. Uh, percentage of the annual audit plan completed, um, number of audits completed, number of recommendations made, number of recommendations implemented. Next one. Quality. Um, you can do an audit satisfaction survey similar to that management uh, uh, survey where you'd simply, right after the audit was done, you'd send a survey to the uh, people you audited, you know, were we professional, uh, did we listen to you, did we, uh, uh, was it clear what we were trying to do, uh, that sort of thing. Not, you wouldn't ask them, are you happy with the report necessarily, because <laughs> That's, that's not what you're trying to get at. Uh, staff audit experience, you could count up the number of years of audit experience you have on your staff, a number of professional certifications, uh, percent of staff meeting the, uh, the CPE requirements, continuing professional education. Um, if, <clears throat> for example, if you're a, a certified public accountant or certified inter internal auditor, you have to achieve so many hours every year of continuing ed, and you have to report that to the, the, the body that uh, granted you that, that certification. Um, number of professional organizations, meetings you attended, number of hours of training for staff, uh, whether or not you passed an external uh, peer review. Efficiency category, <clears throat> you could uh, Track hours spent versus hours budgeted. In other words, uh, you, let's say you decide this auditor has a thousand hours available for a certain period of time. How much was actually spent um, on auditing? Um, you know, how much was spent on administrative time? You know, non-audit time. Uh, time cycle for issuing the draft report. You know, when did you finish your your field work? Uh, when did you issue the report? What was the time lag? Uh, percent of recommendations implemented. Okay, next, and the final one, impact. Uh, <clears throat> percent of budget audited or percent of identified risks audited. Okay. <clears throat> and this statement is from this uh, research report that was done by the IIA chapter in Austin, Texas back in February of 2009. Uh, they did, uh, based on the research, they determined that impact performance measures are seldom used uh, the true impact of audit work is often difficult to quantify. Quality performance measures are the most commonly used performance measures. Okay, next. Um, <clears throat> my advice on what to avoid is there's no holy grail. Uh, the one thing that if you measure it will tell you exactly how the, uh, how the department's doing or how valuable it is. Um, don't measure it just because you can. Every hour spent measuring performance is an hour or less that you could actually spend auditing. Um, don't have too many measures. Ten is way too many. Um, remember what get what's get measured. What gets measured gets audit gets managed. Uh, did I say that correctly? I hope so. <laughs> also, more measures don't equate to better performance. All measures do not need to be. Um, Quantitative, and that was based on a report from uh, uh, internal auditors in the UK and Ireland from uh, 2017. Um, <clears throat> questions that the committee needs to ask before setting the performance measures. Are we really measuring what we're setting out to measure? Um, are you definitely measuring the right thing? <clears throat> Can and will the reported data be acted upon? Well, what are you gonna do with that? <clears throat> so what, question. Is the measure worth the cost of measurement and time and money. Um, is the measure likely to encourage <clears throat> undesirable or inappropriate behaviors? In other words, gaming the system. For example, if you're measuring uh, the number of recommendations made in a, generated in a year, you're incentivizing your auditors to just come up with as many recommendations as they possibly can. Whether they're helpful, whether they're justified, if that's what we're gonna get measured on, we're gonna give you recommendations. Okay, just because a business process or department receives a clean opinion or unmodified opinion, um, or mostly clean, it does not mean the audit was a waste of everybody's time. It's valuable to know that a business process is properly controlled or that a department uh, is achieving its objectives. Okay, a common metric used to assess internal audit department's efficiency is the number of days from completion of field work to issuing the report. 
However, if you adopt that as a performance measure, uh, use that with caution, because sometimes it can lead to uh, wrong behavior where auditors are pushing out a report to meet a deadline before it's really you know, up to snuff. Okay, um, these are just my um, suggestions for the audit committee to consider. Um, for example, percentage of audit plan completed each year, a percentage of audit recommendations agreed to by management each year, um, number of staff with professional certification, um, satisfactory completing a, a peer review by the uh, Association of Local Government Auditors, and we have done that in the past. Um, number of requests that you're receiving, either from the administration or the or city council, uh, that would sort of indicate, uh, do they feel like your work is valuable? Are they wanting you to audit certain areas or topics or contracts? Um, number of recommendations implemented within a given time period, for example, 18 months. Sometimes it can take a while for uh, audit recommendations to be implemented, so you could set a certain time period. You know, how many, what percentage were implemented within um, X number of months? And then you probably want to look at turnover in the audit office. Um, are auditors staying in the office? A red flag would be constant turnover. Um, if uh, auditors are making lateral moves, uh, that, that might be concerning, if, or if they're leaving city employment, so you want to find out why they're doing that. Uh, so that, that might be uh, some things you might want to look at, uh, have discussion on that, and decide what you kind of performance measures you want to give to your, uh, to your internal audit manager and their staff. So, are there any questions? Questions for? Rich. Tony. Do you currently um, do surveys of the people you audit? You know, I did it when I first started the function back in 2007. Um, just I wanted to get a pulse on, you know, are, are we, uh, you know, what, how, are we, how are we being perceived? And you never ask, hey, did you like the report? You know, <laughs> you, you ask, um, um, were we on time? Were we professional? Did we keep you informed? Um, just real simple questions, and we got positive feedback, so we, so we didn't continue that. But that's that's what that w a survey would be. And obviously, the fact that you're asking those questions that would indicate that you have multiple customers in internal audit, yes. one of which is management and management, or you could call it the administration, and then certainly elected officials. And um, one, one thing that we, we started to get is uh, pretty much any time we would ask for input for next year's audit plan, we would get suggestions from management and from city council members. So I, I would think that would indicate that they saw some value in what you're doing. Otherwise, they maybe wouldn't suggest anything. And for the benefit of the public, why, why would you, why do you ask management for recommendations? They're, well, they're in the best condition that they're, uh, to uh, assess risk. They're, they're the ones that are held accountable for the performance of their department. Um, so it, it isn't like just because they suggested that you're going to audit that, but, but it's certainly they're concerned about that or, or they would like some assurance that this program or division is properly controlled or meeting its objectives. Certainly the city council has uh, things that they're concerned about, so you pay uh, serious attention to those and see if you can uh, accommodate the request um, and so so that would be one key part of the risk analysis in developing the annual audit plan yeah yeah because their my management is in a much better position to know what the risks are than the auditors are um, not that we and obviously we, we use professional skepticism on everything when we're doing audit work when we're evaluating requests um, so <clears throat> A lot of auditing is judgment, and a lot of times you, you need to ask management um, what, what, how they perceive the risks and the controls and how they're working. Councilor Kai. And, and this, Rich, I'm sure you can answer this as well as Councilor Neitzer as he's uh, dug into this very deep in, in the last year, but of the performance metrics uh, that you've identified here, the performance measures, what's What's currently, what currently exists today, or is this newly, what you presented today, is that well, what you what, developed what I did, for this I, I would do an annual report. Are you talking about what I did? Or, yes, okay, yes, what, what I you've did, done here. I'd usually have an annual report. I'd usually indicate uh, what percentage of the audit plan was completed, um, and maybe the percentage of uh, recommendations that were agreed to by management, or maybe the percentage that were implemented. Um, 
either then in the annual report or on the report where I, where I um, did the follow-up to audit recommendations. That, that was an annual report. Um, and I think I would all include something about the training if, if we, if, uh, you know, the number of hours of training we did and whether the people that had a professional certification met their, um, their CPE requirement for the year. And then we did do a peer review in 2014. Um, I think uh, the chair of the audit committee a few years previous to that in 2012 had asked the question at a meeting, who audits the auditors? And I said, other auditors, and it's called a peer review. And he says, I think we should do that. And, and we, we did that. We did the preparation for that. And that was in October of 2014. We had ALGA come in and do, and we passed. I mean, we, okay. we, we Based on standards. what you presented here today is, is our uh, uh, internal audit staff's uh, policies and procedures, are, are, are they in need of any updating or are they? Well, we've, we've never received a, a official direction from the audit committee. I just kind of came up with them on my own and reported them and because I thought I should. Uh, but I think this is a case of maybe, maybe making a formal, uh, you know, having the audit committee uh, decide for the new internal audit manager what, how the division is going to be evaluated, come up with some performance measures, so then that person knows this is what we're going to be evaluated on, this is what, what you need to report to the audit committee. And that's what I'm kind of getting yeah. on. So this would be a good start for yeah, this, this committee be excellent start with in doing new, just that. Yeah, yeah, excellent start, yeah. Thank you. Dean. Rich, uh, you just... I, I know that uh, from reading some of the reports that years ago, the internal audit staff reported to the mayor and... Yeah, when I, when I was in finance, we reported basically to the mayor, yeah, and the finance director, yeah. But now you're reporting to the audit committee and, yeah. and city council. Yeah, you don't see any, there, there aren't any other issues with independence that, that you've seen? In terms no, of no, we followed the recommendation. I think when the city council got the report from the uh, state legislative auditors in um, 2005, they recommended I think uh, was to set up an audit committee, and that audit committee would uh, or hire there there would be an internal auditor that would report to the committee, and then they also had suggestions for uh, the situation that had occurred with the overspending. So that came from legislative audit, but I know I Bailey I think had in the. 2004 management letter, I think, had recommended that the internal auditors that were in finance should be independent. Now, that recommendation, uh, I wouldn't want to say it was ignored, but it wasn't implemented. Let's put it that way. It was not implemented, then a year later, uh, the state auditors came in and, and made the same recommendation that I Bailey had made in 2004 or 2002 or whatever it was. So, Thanks. And for the benefit of, of everybody here, I do have the DLA. It's not actually an audit, it's agreed upon procedures that was done for the Phillips to the Falls. And they did recommend that the city council should establish an audit committee, which we did. The audit committee would represent the council's first line of defense with respect to the city's system of internal controls. Uh, they did recommend that it be a mix of private citizens and board members being the city council. Uh, they did recommend that the audit committee should essentially give the marching orders in terms of what to audit to the internal audit division. And they, and this is where is the interesting part. They actually recommended that the internal audit division report administratively to the finance department, but that they would be hired and fired by the city council, the board. And, and their reasoning that they stated was that would, that would uh, free the city council of the burden of essentially the administrative tasks of dealing with employees and things like that, because we're really, I don't know if we had any employees at the time, maybe the city clerk, I, I don't recall. But in any event, that was, that was their recommendation, was that, you know, for time off and things like that, or they could be located in city hall, but they would, but essentially they would be hired and fired still by the city council. There was a lot of acrimony at the time, so the city council went in a different direction and had them report completely to the city council. Um, and then... They talked about the audit committee should work to contract the external audit, which is something that we do. So all, all of those things were implemented, essentially, but so if, if that helps. So, and I would say as chair of the audit committee, the reason I asked Rich to work on this was, again, I, I think one of the struggles has been, particularly for, for those of us that are just city councilors, we're not, we're not in the industry necessarily is again how, how do we measure the performance and the and what we're getting out of our of, out of our 
audit. You know, why, well, what's the right amount? I mean, is it, we, we've, you know, is, you know, is 12 audits enough a year? Is four audits? Is, is the number of audits have nothing to do with it? That's, that's been the struggle. And, and there really hasn't been, at least recently, a clear way in which to measure it. And I think that makes it really hard for us to quantify that we're getting good value for our money. And it also makes it really hard for our staff to know that, 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 you know, that they have something that they can be uh, performing to and that, they, and that they're meeting their expectations. And it, it's a two-way street. And I think it'd be much healthier if we work together. And this was a starting point that I think is collaboratively with the new internal audit manager and as a audit committee that we would talk about what, what should we measure our audit staff by? So that there's clear expectations on, on both sides. And so I, I think this is a great way to start the conversation. Yeah, I think so. it definitely should come from the audit committee or the city council or a combination. They should be telling the internal yeah. audit manager what, how they're going to evaluate the uh, performance. Sure. Um, you know, and some of it is just, it's hard to put a value on internal audit. Uh, let's say you, uh, because you're vigilant about your uh, evaluating uh, fraud controls and you prevent frauds from happening. Well, how would, how would you ever know you prevented a fraud? Other than that, you, you've done audits, you've evaluated internal controls, you have things that you do, and um, so. And, and that's something that I've learned in, in looking at this, is it's very easy to just assume that if an audit comes back clean, well, they must not have looked hard enough. Yeah, you know, they didn't or it find, was a waste of time. It was a waste of time. I but, mean, you, you could know. say, I Bailey, I mean, they came, there was no, there was a, some minor recommendations, it was an unmodified, that You're was looking. not a waste of time. Yep. So. <laughs> There's a value in having the assurance, having the second set of eyes, and when you see a clean audit, it's something to celebrate. Yeah. Say so that yeah. the internal controls are in place because obviously prevention is much more preferable to detection. Yeah. Because you don't want the fraud to happen in the first place or the, yeah. the issues. So. And, and and occasionally I would get a call from a, from a manager or director asking me for their opinion on something. They're thinking about doing something, um, say with the uh, water meters and how often those should be uh, tested or. Uh, they, they had a program at one time for if you installed a low flow toilet or uh, other uh, device that used water, you would get a rebate. And at that time they were going out and visibly, they were verifying every single person that did that. I mean, they would send an employee to the house to verify that they indeed had installed a low flow toilet. And I said, um, how many times have you found somebody that was trying to game the system. They said, well, I think one time out of, how many, how many people did you look at? Out of, you know, we looked at 700 people and we found one cheater. And I said, well, what if you just did a random sample? What do you think about that? Um, and then uh, we talked about that issue. We talked about those controls. I mean, we leave it up to management, but a lot of times they want to pick your brain. They, they, they value your advice. And so we give our, you know, we help them. We're not, we're not, we're not buddies with them, but we're, we're, we're on the same team in the sense that we're city employees and we want things to be efficient and assets to be protected. So. Okay, very good. Uh, Dean, go ahead. One, you know, one point on structure, we talk about reporting to audit committee or, or city council. I think if you've got an audit committee, um, you know, what that means generally is that's who internal audit reports to. General. And that's who external audit reports to, mm -hmm. and and so the the internal or so the audit committee should be the one make, you know, making all those approvals and then um, submitting their recommendation for final approval to the city council. Rather than, I think the direct line is here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say, in my opinion, the audit committee and should set the performance measures, and then audit manager will report those yearly. Sure. And they'd be held accountable for the performance. Okay. Well, my suggestion would be in the future, we could either do a working session or have some sort of discussion where we can, I think as a group, it needs to be talked about which ones would we potentially select and move forward. So be a good discussion for another day. We're not quite to that point yet. So, okay. Very good. Thank you very much. That was very valuable. Appreciate it. Okay. Our next item is recognition. This is a recognition of the service of Rich Oaksell as a part-time internal auditor from August 2018 to May 2019. And 
this is something where I, I, I really felt it was important that we formally recognize Rich for his service and sacrifice to the city, specifically to internal audit uh, and the city council. Rich is gonna be concluding his service here at the end of May, and this is the last meeting that he will be attending, therefore. His formal title is part-time internal auditor, but I, I have to tell you that title doesn't even come close to doing justice to the performance and his contributions. I think it would be more to fair to say that he was really an internal audit manager, a trainer, a mentor, an auditor, and a jack of all trades rolled into one, all in less than 30 hours a week. He's been a mentor for our full-time auditor throughout all of these months. I know she has immense gratitude for the guidance he has provided her, as do I. He has provided me assistance and recommendations. He completed crucial analysis that was integral in developing our audit plan for this year. He has documented a number of processes that future staff are gonna benefit from. There's a number of other tasks he's completed for internal audit, and we've been far more productive during this time of transition because of his service. Thanks to his service part-time, like I said, capped at 30 hours a week, uh, the last several months have been immensely productive, and they've been far more productive than we had when we were fully staffed a few years ago. Rich has the gifts you need in an effective internal auditor, immense knowledge, great analytical skills, fabulous work ethic, and the ability to build relationships with the stakeholders, that includes management, while maintaining objectivity that's critical to performing productive and effective audits. The immediate and improved relationships between internal audit and the city divisions uh, when he came on was palpable and it increased the effectiveness of internal audit. More gets done, the internal audit recommendations carry more weight and legitimacy when internal audit and management work together with a mutual respect and collaboration to make the organization better. I saw it firsthand. Was he paid for his service? Absolutely, but that does not diminish the sacrifice that he made uh, coming on to internal audit and by extension to the city of Sioux Falls and the citizens. Elected officials are paid as well, but that does not diminish their sacrifice or their service. He did not have to come out of retirement. He didn't have to. He didn't have to spend his, his week sitting in the basement of Carnegie Town Hall when he could have been enjoying time with his wife. He did it because he, he wanted to help us in our time of need, and he cares deeply about the future of our internal audit division. Because of his service, the last several months, we were able to restructure internal audit while keeping it operational so that it can be stronger going forward. He and his wife are ready for him to enjoy retirement again. Both he and his wife have made an incredible sacrifice for us, and I will be forever grateful for that sacrifice. I know others will be too, including those of the city council. Rich will be tying up some loose ends during the month of May and will conclude his service around May 31st. Thank you, Rich, and enjoy your summer with your wife. Thank you very much, you, you don't know how much I appreciate it. The next item up is open discussion. Does anybody have any open discussion? I do have a few items and since we're running a little late, I'm gonna try to go quick. Um, Abby has completed the P-card audit. Uh, management responses and exit meetings didn't quite make the cutoff for this meeting, but it will be presented at the next audit committee meeting. We completed a remodel downstairs at a very modest cost, I might add, and moved our audit staff into offices alongside some of our other council staff. Uh, and that is going to greatly uh, improve their ability to uh, work and be productive. And it's just a better work environment. They, they honestly were kind of stuffed in a corner on their own, and it, and it just wasn't a, a, great, a great situation. Uh, with the savings and payroll this year, we have slack in the budget that we can use to get additional training, and we've been doing that, and we've been, with Rich's help, I've been working on some uh, classes and trainings and certifications through the IA that we can uh, put our auditors through. Um, and so we've been working on that, and, and I'm hopeful that we can be aggressive with training, continuing education, and certification going forward. Our new audit up ordinance is into effect. The audit charter is now in that ordinance. We recently contracted with a new fraud hotline provider. We used to pay $2,000 a year for that service, and we went and looked and got several quotes. We're now paying just over $1,000 a year. We cut the cost in half. But the most exciting part is before for $2,000, we had a 24-7-800 number, and that's it. Now you can report with the 800 number, you can report online, you can report by email, text capability is coming. It has uh, two-way conversational capability where you can stay completely uh, um, anonymous, but you can get a PIN number and a case number, and, and so uh, we can interact with somebody making a report, and we can go back and forth, we can ask them for information, we can customize the website uh, as much as we want. 
There's just an, a number of, of other features. This particular vendor is the second largest in the nation. I think they have 3,000 customers, including hundreds of municipalities um, and state governments and counties. So that's uh, really exciting. We've done, I will call it a soft launch, where I've had the phone number changed on the internal website. We haven't done a full-on launch. Um, still working on doing some things to um, essentially rebrand it and come up with a launch plan where essentially we, we can get all of the advertising out to city employees. Right now, as I talk to city employees, very many of them don't even know there's a broad hotline at all. Um, it, it's buried on the city website, and we, we just... And that's why we're not getting any engagement, I believe. That's one of the reasons, of course. I would hope part of the reason also is that we have a wonderful city, but, you know, nobody's perfect. But I'm hoping to do a relaunch soon, and that would include prominent website advertising, uh, boards, emails. Uh, part, it would be part of our ethics training. I've worked with the city attorneys who are now doing ethics training. It's now included. So we can get all of that in there so we can keep reminding employees that you've got multiple modes that you can go through. You can go to, um, you can go to your manager. You can go to HR. You can go to the city attorney. But if you're not comfortable, you can call the anonymous fraud hotline. And I'm not sure I'm even necessarily like the word fraud hotline. In, in my company, um, we don't just call it a fraud hotline because sometimes people have a very narrow idea of what what can I call it for? So, it, you know, sometimes people more, like in my company, we call it the ethics and compliance hotline. You know, and so, but, but we also have an ethics board, so we have to be really careful in how we brand it that we don't create essentially confusion about who am I going to and things like that. So, any other open discussion? Okay. Last item is public comment. This is a time for anybody to comment on what we've talked about at the meeting. I'd invite uh, anybody up. Um, and you have five minutes. Welcome, Bruce. Bruce Danielson. What I'm going to talk about is not to disrespect any person on this board or any, anybody that's being hired, but I do have some questions based on 40 years of experience in internal and external auditing of, of data. One of the projects I did about 20 years ago involved uh, leading an effort at a company that in an effort to save a thousand jobs, we uncovered a $500 million scheme running in 22 different scenarios. Internal audit is nothing to be sneezed at. I understand what the work Rich has been doing and the problems that arose back all those years ago when this department was set up and this committee was set up. My, my questions involve how the department is being staffed right now or how it's going to be staffed. How does, a, how does transferring an entrenched city employee into the internal audit department uh, point accomplish of order, its original Mr. purpose? Mr. Chair, um, Why I, is this I believe body the, willing excuse me, a point of order was hold made. On, hold on. I, I believe Kelly. that uh, public comment is to be directed at items on the agenda. Uh, where the individual is going right now, that is not an agenda item. Yeah, could you keep it to... It, actually, some... it does, because Mr. Oskell just went through the parameters for setting up an internal audit department. We've just listened to uh, Mr. Speak Feisley to those parameters, do not speak to a hiring out. process. So I am following the guidance of this process, and I am following, and you're using up my time. And so I'm, I'm, just, I'm looking at five minutes Excuse me, of point of order? That allows Councilor Kiley, hold, hold on. Once again, we have a policy as to what public comment should be about, and I, I'm just trying to uphold that policy, so please adhere to it. That's my recommendation to the chair. Yeah, just try to keep it in the lane of what we've talked I, about. If you can I weave it into that. Okay. That criteria that Mr. Oskell laid out, and I appreciate what he said in there. And as I've worked with this, and now we've lost over a minute of my time, it's why would a chosen new hire of any kind be willing to be put in a position of having to recuse from audits involving prior work. Now, this is important. He just Mr. said, Mr. Chair, in point here, of order. Once again, he's wandered off of any topic that was addressed. We're, we're getting afternoon. into things that we were not on the agenda today. We, you want to talk about performance have, metrics, what, or Mr. Chair? 
we actually have, as Mr. Oskell just laid out, a series of points that mean a great deal in this process. What we just went through, listening to the Ike Bailey report, we just listened to Mr. Fifely, Mr. Oskell, all of these people, including the work that, that this young woman did in her job. She, all of this was laid out properly to establish that what we're looking at in an internal audit is being able to go in and feel comfortable and let the citizens feel comfortable about the process. And any time you shut off a discussion, Mr. Kiley, that you have shut off the people's ability to come in and discuss these issues and to feel comfortable that we are actually getting a problem solved. When we get our comments shut off in a situation like this, and you have now caused me to use up several minutes of my time, I am now asking that I be allowed to finish my process here. I will coach my words accordingly, but all of you in this whole process, set yourselves up for maybe where I need to be in my summary. That in order for an internal audit to be done properly and to lead an internal audit department, and this is what we learned in trying to save those thousand jobs here in Sioux Falls, was curiosity. We had a staff of six people in this one particular office and our only requirement in this job was to have insatiable curiosity. We had the curiosity to say, why did this happen? We were given 100% access to any piece of data that was in that company to find out what was going on. We did one audit process in that, in that in, when I was brought on. We made $11 million in this one process. To continue to the next step in the process, we found out we lost $44 million. They thought they were making money. When it all got said and done, when we actually closed out that process, I did a report where we found we lost $178 million. How that all tied back in is we were an internal audit department that was totally staffed by people from outside the business that was, a, and these six people, not one of them was a previous employee of this company. We all went in and found a way to solve the problems that were in this business through curiosity. All I'm trying to say, and this is after I had been uh, questioned by attorneys, we had federal investigators, the business ended up going into, into receivership because the feds came in and said something wasn't right. There were RICO violations in this. All I'm laying out is if you bring in anybody into the internal audit department that is previously employed by the city of Sioux Falls, has any connections in the city of Sioux Falls, you could end up having violations and is it going to be worth it to you to spend the time going through all of the legal requirements that we had to go through. Thank you. Anybody else for public comment? Seeing none, I'll adjourn this meeting.